Okay, this is the RBT training on the introvertibal, um, which just to review, we already went over the man, the tack, the colic, and just generally verbal behavior. And then this one is about the introvertible. Um, so to review, um, the introvertible is a type of verbal behavior that's defined by number one, the circumstances under which it occurs, and number two, the consequence that it produces. So here is the little three-term ABC unit about the introverbal. Um, the antecedent is someone's verbal behavior. The behavior is introverbal behavior. Um, for this one, it's got like a little special thing. For the echoic, it's like it has to match what the person says. Um, for the tact, it has to match the thing in the natural environment. For the man, it has to match the thing they want. For an introverbal behavior, there's like a super wide variety of forms it can take. It can basically take any form. The only requirement is that it does not, it's not an echoic. Um, and then GCR is the reinforcer, which we'll talk about. Um, <clears throat> so here are some delightful little pictures that kind of convey what an introverbal is. They have a lot to do with conversation. Here's another conversation. And you can read that. Please. It's kind of funny. Did you read it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the antecedent, someone's verbal behavior that's a little bit kind of broad. So commonly that is a question or a comment, but it could be anything. So a lot of times like, you know, if somebody says like, hey, what's your favorite color? That's someone else's, and then you say red. That's someone else's verbal behavior, and then your behavior of saying red must be an introverbal because you're responding to somebody else's verbal behavior. And then we've already talked about this. What is GCR? It is generalized conditioned reinforcement. Um, and so by generalized, we mean it's not specific to any one motivation. Like, oh, I'm thirsty. Like, water is not GCR because. You, you want water when you're thirsty and it's associated with that need. Something like money is not associated with any need in particular because you can get anything with it almost. Um, <clears throat> praise and attention are not really associated with a particular need. They're just kind of like always a nice little bonus usually depending on who it's coming from. Um, <clears throat> and then condition means that it's learned, me, meaning that it's not like one of your most basic it doesn't meet one of your most basic needs that you claim out of the womb as being reinforcers like food, warmth, things like that. It's something that like you learn to like. Um, and it's a reinforcer, obviously. So understanding the introverbal, like with the tact and the man and the echoic, there was something kind of like an easy way to be like, this is what it is. Like a man is a request or a demand. A tact is a good way to think of it might be like a label or something that corresponds to something in the environment or a comment. Um, and an echoic um, is vocal imitation. So the interverbal, this is kind of cheating, but a, one way to think about it is it's not an echoic and it's not a man and it's not tact. <laughs> So introverbals are so broad because of that middle um, middle requirement that it it can have any form and it's in response to somebody else's verbal behavior. Like how many times a day do you respond to someone else's verbal behavior? As you can imagine, in verbal behavior takes a variety <clears throat> of forms. So as long as that as long as it's in response to someone's verbal behavior, you can call it an introverbal. It's kind of like man tacticoic everything else. Is the introvert. Kind of. Um, so even though it is very broad, commonly, and especially having to do with our programming when you're working with kids, um, introverbals frequently show up as answers to questions, responses to comments. So if you say like, oh, I, um, you know, I saw the new movie yesterday and then somebody else says like, oh, I love that movie, that's an introvertal. Um, and fill-ins. So cat and the, it would be hat, um, of mice and men. And then ollie ollie, oxen free. Like when you're playing, playing hide and seek. 
Um, so why is the interverbal important? Um, because, so this is what it is, frequently turns up as answers to questions, response to comments, and fill-ins. Why is that important? Because the interverbal frequently turns up as answers to questions, responses to comments, um, and fill-ins, such as little bunny foo-foo hopping through the forest. Um, you read my mind. Knock, knock. Who's there? Um, so, yeah, where would we be without being able to answer questions and respond to other people's comments? That's like what we do all day. So, <clears throat> obviously it's an important operant. Um, where would we be without it? We wouldn't have Family Feud. Family Feud, these things are, that, that game is basically like an interverbal game <clears throat> because it's responses to questions. Um, and another, of course, the glorious, most favorite game of all, catchphrase, is an interverbal game. I don't, if you don't know what catchphrase is, it's where you have like a <clears throat> secret word and you're trying to get everybody else to say it. So say the word is white, you say not black, but, and that's a fill-in. Or say the word is um, water bottle and you say you drink out of it, holds your, it holds liquid that's clear, water bottle. So those are interverbals. <clears throat> um, so why else is it important? Interverbal verbal behavior is like the conversational icing on a tax and manned cake, if that makes sense, which I'm sure it does. Um, so if you can tax and man, you can kind of like, those are kind of like your basic building blocks to get by and meet your needs. But if you're gonna get into like more sophisticated conversation, then you're gonna need interverbals. So conversation is an intricate dance of texts, mans, and interverbals, even echoics. Like this complex dance we have here. Very complex dance. It's a macarena. Hey. The most complex of all. Macarena. <laughs> Um, so let's look at just like a simple little instance of chit chat and we can dissect it and think about what operants are happening during conversation. So here's the little scene. Uh, Barb says, hi. Hi. Um, how have you been? Oh, pretty good. I saw Hilda the other day. Oh, wow. She was a hot mess, but I miss her. How's she doing? She got married to Larry. Married to Larry? Tell me about it. So if that's our little conversation, we can look at it. So when Barb says to Wanda, hi, um, what operant do we think that is? So Barb, nobody said anything. She just saw Wanda and then she said hi, which makes it a, so Wanda's, just her body is nonverbal, says hi, and then Wanda said hi back, which makes it a tact. Um, and so now, <clears throat> Wanda is responding to Barb's hi, and she says hi. So it's verbal behavior, verbal behavior, and then continuing with the conversation. So that makes it a interverbal. Um, and then Barb says, how have you been? Which is a question. And the answer from Wanda is pretty good. So that's a man because it's a man for information. The reinforcer is information related to the question. Um, and then now if we're going to talk about when Wanda says pretty good, what she responding to, she was responding to Barb's question, which makes it an interverbal. And then when she says, I saw Hilda the other day, um, what made that, <coughs> what made that statement happen was the fact that she saw Hilda, so really Hilda is the non-verbal thing in the environment, so that makes it attacked. Um, <clears throat> and then when Barb says, oh wow, she's responding to the fact that Wanda said I saw Hilda the other day. So that's someone else's verbal behavior, so that makes it an interverbal. Um, and then Barb says, she was a hot mess, um, I, but I miss her. So she's talking about a feeling that she has, and feeling is nonverbal, it's part of you, so that's um, something in the environment, so that makes it attacked. 
Um, and then she says, how is she doing? And how is she doing is a question where, what does she want for that? She wants an answer, which makes it a man. Um, and then Wanda says, she got married to Larry. So she was responding to Barb's question of how is she doing, which makes it a and interverbal. Um, and then Barb says, married to Larry, which you might want to think that it's an interverbal, but if you look at it, it's like she got married to Larry. Married to Larry, so it's a echoic. Um, and then Wanda says, tell me about it, which is an interverbal because she was responding to Barb's comment or question <coughs> of married to Larry. And if you'll notice with the into this one, when Wanda says, tell me about it, that could be, I mean, it sounds like a demand, like tell me, but the way it's used here is like, oh my gosh, tell me about it. Larry's such a loser. Um, so, <laughs> so that means more, it's, it's not functioning as a man in that instance. That's why you can't tell what the operant is just from looking at the words or looking at what they're saying because look, you have high and you have high, one is attacked and one's an interval. And this is also a good place to talk about just a reminder, we already talked about this, but verbal operants are very clear on paper when you do that like A, B, C, and they all have a nice clear definition. However, in real life, they're a little bit more complex and messy because a lot of different things are happening. Like, where's this tact? I saw Hilda the other day. So technically it's like Hilda occasioned this behavior, but, you know, she's also part of part of the conversation responding to somebody else's verbal behavior. So technically, kind of like, you know, all of these could maybe be interverbals. So, so how many, that was a, that was like a, how many sentences is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight little exchanges, or eight, each person comments or talks eight times, four times. And <clears throat> there were 11 operands and five of them were interverbals. So most of them were interverbal. And really, technically, you could kind of consider all of them interverbal because they're all, except for the initial high, except for the initial high, they're all in response to um, someone else's verbal behavior. Um, so why, why else are they important? We use interverbal prompts a lot of the time. Introverbals a lot of time are what serve as verbal prompts for kids who might be a little bit higher functioning and only need little hints. So th this is nice because you can use very minimally intrusive verbal hints, verbal prompts, such as like hints. Um, so say you say like, you know, what says moo? And instead of using like a, a code prompt and say like cow, which is basically just giving them the answer, you can say what says moo? And then you can say like, we learned about it yesterday or, you know, it's black and white. And so as long as the item's not there, that's an intraverbal <coughs> that you're using to hint. Um, and like also mnemonic devices, things like, so if you're helping your kid remember days of the month and you do like 30 days has September, April, June, like those are the fact that those go in order and you, April, June and November is like you can help your client without just telling them the answer or using really um, intrusive heavy prompts. And so when we get into more really complex verbal behavior, it gets really important because we kind of discuss their makeup, their what interverbal behavior is part of what makes up conversational units. Basically, if you say like, hey, how you doing? I'm fine. That's an interverbal because you're responding to somebody else's verbal behavior. So without interverbal behavior, conversation would be nothing. <laughs> like it would be real hard. <laughs> Um, and conversation is, of course, what turns into, like, one of the most important leisure skills. It's what, you know, can be a foundation for our friendships and relationships. So, obviously, that's really, really important for our kids who sometimes don't have those things. And then where it gets really important as well is because of those, we talked about the fill-ins, like, beep. No, what am I trying to do? Wine and cheese. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> I, so like the audience can participate, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So like any of those things like, you know, cat and the hat. Anytime you're making connections between two two types of verbal response, usually it's a lot of times gonna be um, intraverbal behavior. And so that's when these we get these like big webs of different connections and where you get into like thinking and problem solving because if you think about it like a lot of thinking is talking to yourself so if you're in the store aisle and you say like oh what was it that I had on the list and then on the grocery list and grocery list makes you think of like oh well it was chicken and milk and then chicken and milk makes you think aisle five so a lot of that has to do with that it's like notice if you'll notice before we didn't specify it has to be somebody else's verbal behavior it could be your own verbal behavior like I'm talking a lot and I'm responding to the rest of my own verbal behavior so in a lot of ways us if you get, hear someone give a speech um, a lot of that is interverbal behavior because they're responding to what they just said <clears throat> um, and then creativity too that's where you get those connections and you're thinking like I want to make write a play what should I write those are interverbal responses. If you imagine, this makes me think of like every detective movie and cop show where they have like a, some sort of crazy map with red mm -hmm. pins on the screen and then they're like working through the problem like why would a serial killer be at this place at this time and then like the climax of every movie is a lot of times when somebody hears somebody say something and then it like leads to this big conclusion. Like that's that's interverbal behavior because well, like it's like loose clues, which is nothing but interverbal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because it's all loose clues too. It's like mm -hmm. I found oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> so interverbal is like that boost into getting our kids to actually really learn those like higher order, more complex, really useful behaviors. Um, so some of the common interverbal programming that we see, you'll see maybe like conversational exchanges um, to kind of like, we contrive these at first and just kind of use artificial reinforcement to like teach them to say like, oh, I have a striped shirt on. Well, I have a purple shirt on. Oh, I have brown hair. I have short black hair. And at first it's kind of, you know, really contrived, but then that puts these kids in positions to like participate in a social environment. And then maybe they start getting real reinforcement from the people they're conversing with. So you'll see those. Um, you might see greetings programs, which a lot of our kids, if you walk by and say hi, they'll totally ignore you or they won't initiate a greeting. Um, initiating the greeting is actually probably more of a tact because you're responding to the person themselves and not their verbal behavior. But when you respond to a greeting, that's interverbal behavior. Um, you might see association. So you might see like, what goes with shoes? I'm stopped. Yeah. <laughs> what goes with shoes? Socks. What goes with crackers? Peanut butter. Yeah, what goes with jelly? <laughs> Peanut butter. Bread. Everything. <laughs> so like what goes with cat? Dog. Dog. Yeah. And for a lot of those it's not like there's a right answer, but there are wrong answers. So you you know, you just want something appropriate. Um, or those fill ins like peanut butter and crackers. Peanut butter and jelly, um, cat and cat and dog, black and white. Um, and then you can take a lot of programs that are tapped programs and if you just remove that item, now it's an interverbal verbal program. So <laughs> instead of saying like, tell me about this phone and they can see the phone so they're tapping and they're saying like it has a dot so you call with it, it's flat, it's orange. Um, if you say like, tell me about a monkey, and there's no monkeys around, and they say like it says, e -e -o -o -a! it's an animal, it's hairy, it's cute. Those are that's interverbal behavior because they're not responding to like an actual thing that's present. Um, sometimes describe this is the same thing we wanted to get like okay, tell me about this, and we want kind of like rapid fire, like really strong, fluent, fast. It's red, it's, or it's orange, it's you talk on it, all these things. <clears throat> you um, same thing with descriptions of events or items or um, how to do things um, so you can like you can say like tell me what happens when you get up in the morning and then if the person can say like well I get out of bed I brush my teeth I eat breakfast I go to school 
that's a sequence of events that is not happening currently, but they're responding to your question. Um, and literally any question or information. A lot of like, if you go to like a high school, what the teacher is doing for the students is interverbal. Um, like what's the definition of this word? And then you say the definition, it's, that's interverbal behavior. Um, so or it could be a teaching, right? Yeah. What? The Socratic. Yeah. So, so interverbals, because it's such a broad category and because it's kind of such a, like a, everything is some man deck, go on, it's interverbal. Um, you can, you can, it like, the sky is the limit. Um, so, and then I have some, I'll show you. Teaching interverbals, it's not really, the MAND is the only operant that has like special teaching procedures because you have to make sure you're getting that motivation. Just like the TAC, the interverbal is pretty basic. Like we use the same teaching strategies that we use for everything, like prompting and prompt fading. Um, the only thing that's nice about an interverbal, since it's like one of the higher level operants, you, your kids should be able to tact and MAND already right. a little bit <clears throat> when they're learning interverbals. That might not be the case because there's splinter skills, but a lot of times they can. Um, so say so say you have a kid and you show them this. I don't know if you can see this. Kangaroo. Kangaroo. It's kangaroo. Yeah. So if you say like, what is this? Kangaroo, that's a tact. If you say, what's this? Moose. Moose. That's a tact. Um, so say you're now now you're trying to um, teach categories without say showing the actual animals and you say like Tell me three animals. Moose, kangaroo, and sheep. Good job! And you can even, since you don't want to teach like moose, kangaroo, and sheep are the only animals, you could just lay out a bunch of animals in front of your kiddo and say like, tell me three animals. And then, you know, pro point to different ones to prompt as like a little tech prompt and then maybe slowly start to turn them over or fade them out or stop showing them or turn into like, and, or say you're working on, um, you know, feature. And you say like, tell me an animal that is fluffy. Bunny. Yeah, tell me an animal that's fluffy. Bunny. Tell me an animal that's fluffy. Bunny. Whoop whoop. And then so I faded that prompt out by just doing it a little bit faster. So that's like a really good, if you have a kid who has a lot of tax, um, that's a good effective prompt to use because you're using behavior that they already have and then you're just transferring that tact into an actual interverbal. Um, of course, you can use a cook and verbal prompts. Like I could also say like, tell me an animal that's fluffy. Bunny. Bunny. Yeah. And do it like normal. Bunny. Bunny. Um, you know, fade that out. Um, and we use the same prompting and prompt fading that we've already learned and talked about as we use for other skills. Um, so basically what does this mean for you as a therapist? Uh, you know, you're not going to be writing the interverbal programs, but it is kind of nice to know because sometimes these programs can look a little silly, like why does my kid need to know cheese and crackers, computer and mouse, like, you know, sticks and stones. Some of those things seem like what? but we're trying to get to that like super higher order building associations between different things and having saying one thing and thinking of a different thing that's not necessarily like we want to get away from learning like cheese and like actual cheese because it's that you know cheese does lots of different things, things. 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 things and you eat it and you do all kinds of things um, <clears throat> and so like and sometimes song fillings are a program like twinkle twinkle little star but if a kid can do that they're going to be more, some kids won't do that automatically and so they need to be taught and then that helps them have that like thinking behavior um and then but with those programs so i've seen kids have those fill-in programs or those like what goes with programs <coughs> and they're like a dog goes with and it's supposed to be bone but this kid is four and they don't have a dog and then, you know what I mean? Like it's totally unfamiliar stimuli. So 
if the kid's experienced in real life, like dogs do go with bones. Every time I see a dog, I see a bone. It's related to tax. So when somebody says like dog and bone, they should be also relating it to like what their experience. If you just teach, use prompting and prompt fading to teach a kid who doesn't know anything about dogs and bones to say dog and bone, that's where it, that's where it really is silly. So you want to kind of, if you notice that stuff in, you know, kids programming or, you know, maybe some stimuli is like you see dog and bone for a kid who you know doesn't have a dog and has very limited, like doesn't watch television, you, that's a place where you would be awesome to communicate to the behavior consultant like, hey, I think we're just teaching this. I don't know if he gets this at all. And a lot of times you can tell too by the data. Just go back and yeah. Back. Yeah. Because sometimes, I don't know, a lot of times we use like picture, like picture sets, not here, usually we print them off the internet, but I've seen picture sets where some of them are like super dated. <laughs> well, it's like a picture of a computer that's like, nobody's computer looks like that anymore. Like so like, phone. yeah, we're like, why are you going to teach a kid that when they can't use it? Um, so yeah, it's just kind of, you know, good to know and to know like that's why you're doing what you're doing. Um, so just to review, an intraverbal is a type of verbal behavior where the antecedent is verbal behavior. Um, the, the behavior is, quote, an appropriate response. I put this because it's, it's verbal behavior. It can have any form. The only rule is, like, it can't be an echoic. You don't want it to be what somebody else is, has just said. Otherwise, it's an echoic. Um, and it's, like, it should be appropriate in the context. So if, if Amanda says, like, how you doing, Hannah? And I say, like, a gorilla. Like, yeah, the antecedent was Amanda saying, Hannah, how you doing? But, like, that should be a red flag. Maybe I really am acting as a gorilla or, you know, doing something other than interverbal behavior because it's not appropriate. Um, interverbal behavior is foundational for higher order skills like reasoning and problem solving. Um, and it's crucial for conversation. So that's all for that one.